Hey everyone, I just want to give you all a quick heads up before we start the show. This episode discusses suicide and may not be suitable for all listeners. And please, if you or someone you know is experiencing suicidal thoughts, call or text 988. Or you can talk with someone online at 988lifeline.org. That's 988lifeline.org. And now, the show. When I woke up that morning, I still didn't know the Golden Gate Bridge even existed. I definitely didn't know it was famous or iconic for suicide attempts. I was going to ask the toll caper at the Bay Bridge how to get to the Golden Gate Bridge, but I was telling myself that he or she would look at me and ask me why I was going. Because part of me wanted to tell somebody why I wanted to go. Well, I wanted to say why I wanted to get myself out of pain. I got to the Bay Bridge and the lady looked at me. She never really looked at me in my eyes. She kind of gave me a glance and told me directions and kind of sent me on my way. And I knew that I was 25 minutes from my destiny. I received a call of a man on the sidewalk talking on a cell phone saying that he's going to jump. And as I neared the North Tower, I see the description of him and he's still on the cell phone. He looks my direction and then jumps over this rail. I thought he was gone. My name is Kevin Berthia, a suicide prevention advocate and speaker and founder of the Kevin Berthia Foundation. I'm Kevin Briggs, a retired sergeant with the California Highway Patrol, and I worked on the Golden Gate Bridge for many years as a negotiator. I'm Kate Tucker, and this is Hope Is My Middle Name, a podcast from Consensus Digital Media. Today, we're talking with Kevin Berthia and Kevin Briggs. Their lives intersected unexpectedly one cold March morning on the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. They met again years later in New York City, and that meeting changed both of their lives. Today, they're a team of sorts. They often travel together to share their story, to help others know they're not alone in their struggle with mental health issues. They recently sat down together at Kevin Briggs' home and spoke to me and my producer, Christine. And I'm not going to sugarcoat it, their story can be hard to hear, but it's important and it's powerful and ultimately it's hopeful. Let's start with you, Kevin Berthia. I'd love to go back to your childhood. Where did you grow up and what was it like for you as a kid? I was born in Oakland, California. I was adopted at age six months to an African-American family. Well off, two parents, two older sisters, very caring family. I had a pretty great life, but just internally is where my battle was because I couldn't understand how could somebody just look at me and give me up because my, my mom told me early in life that I was adopted. When you grow up in an African-American community, you're kind of the only kid that's adopted because most African-American kids, somebody in the family picks up that child, an aunt, mm -hmm. a niece. I felt alone. I didn't look like my family, even though I can identify them because we were all African-American, but we didn't look alike. So it was just that struggle of trying to figure out where I belong, where I come from. Mm -hmm. I lived a pretty good childhood. I played a lot of sports, very active in church. Everything was pretty much in place until my parents divorced. And I was at 13 where everything fell out of control at that point. That was the first time in my life that I felt adopted. Mm. Um, it was the first time in my life that I felt alone. My dad took it one way. My mom took it one way. My sisters took it. And I kind of got left out of the equation as far as being checked on as far as how I was doing and how I handled the divorce. Mm. You know, it triggered a lot of things in me that I didn't know even existed. From 13 to 16, I found myself finally learning how to attempt suicide, learning about suicide. Prior to that, I never knew anything about suicide. I had ideations, but I never attempted to do anything yet. When did you get some clarity on your situation? I mean, was there a diagnosis and how did that come to be? I got diagnosed at 19. I ended up going to a psychiatric hospital on a 5150. Mm -hmm. At 19 years old was the first time I ever heard the word mental health, depression, suicide, uh, because we didn't talk about those things in Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. Mental health wasn't talked about like how we talk about it now. And I thought it was something they were lying about. So I didn't accept it or really identify it until I really learned about it. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, when you think about these ideas of who you are at 19, you kind of pretty much have who you are figured out about yourself. And I just, I didn't believe it to enough to, to accept it, to talk about it. I just thought it was just this normal thing that everybody has to deal with. Yeah, you're a kid and you're like, I guess this is how life feels. And you're struggling with suicidal thoughts and maybe you think everybody else is dealing with the same thing. You're not being given the space to kind of express where you're at. So what did that mean for you as you became more familiar with your own depression? It let me feel more alone in life than I've ever felt. Because the more and more I learned about what I was dealing with, it made me isolate myself from the world. Because I didn't believe anybody else in the world was struggling with this. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until years later that I found out that it was millions of people in the world that struggled with this. And thousands of people that died. I mean, you know, I didn't I had no idea about what I was up against. Yeah. I want to pause there and shift over to you, Kevin Briggs. I know that you've also gone through some similar struggles in different ways in your life as Kevin Berthia, and I want to get to those, but I want to go to where you are assigned to the Golden Gate Bridge. And I just wonder, did you ask for that assignment, and did you have any idea what it might entail? I had no idea what I was stepping into. Now, mind you, I grew up in Marin County, and Marin County connects to San Francisco via the Golden Gate Bridge. And my father had a business in San Francisco, so I crossed that bridge many, many times. But I had no idea about the number of suicides and suicide attempts on that bridge. So when I was with the Highway Patrol, I started over in the East Bay, over by Oakland. I had to spend about five years there. And when I did get over to Marin County, I was wondering why people didn't want to work on the Golden Gate Bridge. I thought it would be really cool. You meet people from all over the world. And well, I found out rather quickly why. And that was because of the number of instances that occur with people attempting or completing suicides. Hmm. When you took that assignment, did you get any training? I had no training whatsoever in how to handle this case, how to respond to it, what should I do, what to say, what not to say. Mm -hmm. In my thought process, I'm thinking, well, if they jump, am I responsible? Am I in trouble? I was very naive about it, but I tell people straight out from the highway patrol that was very much a, a disservice to me and those people that I was speaking with. How did you develop your process in responding to people who were in crisis? Just by speaking with them and afterwards, I would ask them, what did I do that helped the situation? And what did I do that wasn't so good? Mm -hmm. So I developed techniques for myself that I now pass on to other negotiators in the hopes they can use these or try these techniques. And I also talked to other people who had worked down there. Uh, eventually, I did get some training through the Highway Patrol, Crisis Intervention Team Training, CIT. And it was way later, almost when I was going to retire, that I went through the FBI crisis negotiators course, which was wonderful, which I should have been allowed to do many, many years prior. Yeah. You talked about the importance of listening in these situations. I'd love for you to talk more about what that actually means, listening to understand. I want to be a sounding board. And the big thing is, this is a crisis. So... I'm not going to try to fix anything, and nor could I probably do it anyway, but I can certainly sit there and listen to them and not argue with them, take it all in to learn more about them, and then maybe later on down the line, come up with some different avenues that they may not have seen to try and not to say, well, you know what you should have done, Yeah. but more of, well, have you tried this? And not to say that I understand where they're coming from, because being on the sidewalk is one thing. Climbing over this four-foot rail and standing on this little I-beam that is 220 feet down into the water, that's a whole nother story. Mm. That takes a lot of courage. People think that suicide is a coward's way out and selfish and all. It's not. I want them to understand that these folks are in deep, deep emotional pain. Mm-hmm. So I want to try to understand really what is going on with them and how did it come to be that they are in that position now. How many people do you think you encountered who had the courage to step over that rail? I handled four to six cases a month 
Now, that's not just people over the rail. Maybe they're on the sidewalk or they're in the parking lots. That's what it turned out to was about four to six a month for around 10 years. Wow. When you are listening to understand, what about you as Kevin Briggs with the experience you've had in life? What do you think allowed you to do that so intuitively? When I was in the United States Army in Germany, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. Mm. I had my first operation in Germany, and they flew me back to San Francisco. I turned 21 on the day I landed back here in the United States. So I underwent three surgeries and then several months of chemotherapy. We know nowadays cancer is talked about freely, but we certainly didn't talk about it back in 1983 when I was going through this, nor was there any way for me to look this up on the internet and find out more about what I was going through. Hmm. You lose all your hair. You're sick all the time. I went down to 135 pounds. Oh. You get depressed. It's very tough. But I got through that. I wanted to be in law enforcement, so I was hired on with corrections, and I was actually working at San Quentin for a while when my mother developed cancer. Mm -hmm. and she tried chemotherapy. It just didn't go well for her. Subsequently, she, after a long, long illness, she passed away at the early age of just 49 years old. Mm -hmm. And we look at how things affect people and how mental illness can develop. Well, there's my cancer. There's her cancer. Uh, I was involved in a very serious motorcycle crash on duty mm -hmm. where another motorcyclist crossed over the center median and hit me head on. That trauma of being involved in that with that significant head injury is another aspect of this. While I was on the job, I had some very severe abuse when I was a young man by uh, a neighbor, which took me decades to talk about and get some therapy on. And I've went through some different therapies, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, EMDR, which helped. Mm. And then I tried stellate ganglion block, which are injections into your neck by your spine, which can help reset the brain. It was fascinating stuff, and that has seemed to help some too. So I'd like people to be aware of the different processes and things that are out there to help them. Mm -hmm. It strikes me as really powerful that both of you at a very young age are kind of waking up to the realities of mental health and how fragile all of our own individual circumstances can be. When that was happening for you, there wasn't a lot of support. And so that's where it gets really dangerous when we feel like we're alone, because that's really where we can make those decisions that in a state of belonging or a sense of security, we may not make. So I'm curious if it's okay with both of you. I'd like to go into that day that you first met. March 11th, 2005. I woke up about 4.42. Couldn't go back to sleep. It was pain that I couldn't shake. Mm. I've always been my own kind of motivational speaker. Like, come on, Kev, let's just get through this. Let's just get dressed. You know, I couldn't get past the emotion. And I, I told myself, I don't want to bear another day. Mm -hmm. That I thought about the Golden Gate Bridge. When I woke up that morning, I still didn't know the Golden Gate Bridge even existed. Being born and raised in Oakland, California, I knew about the Bay Bridge because I had to travel over the Bay Bridge to get to school. My first year of college in San Francisco. But, you know, I'm from Oakland and people from Oakland, a lot of us don't really go over the other bridge. Mm -hmm. I definitely didn't know it was famous or iconic for suicide attempts. That morning when I got up and I finally chose the Golden Gate Bridge, I thought I was going to be the first person that was jumping off this bridge. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know how to get to the bridge that day. I put enough gas in my car just to get where well, I felt like I was going to get there and I didn't have direction. So I said I was going to ask somebody. Yeah, I was going to ask the toll caper at the Bay Bridge how to get to the Golden Gate Bridge. But I was telling myself that he or she will look at me and ask me why I was going. Because part of me wanted to tell somebody why I wanted to go. Well, I wanted to say why I wanted to get myself out of pain. I got to the Bay Bridge and the lady looked at me. She never really looked at me in my eyes. She kind of gave me a glance and told me directions and kind of sent me on my way. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I was 25 minutes from my destiny. And I finally get out there and I parked my car and grabbed my prepaid phone and I started walking. And I told myself I left the keys in ignition. Once I got on the bridge, I was walked for about 15 minutes, which felt like five hours in my head. I remember making one phone call, which 
kind of didn't go the way I wanted to go. I don't know if they didn't answer or anything or if they hung up. Something happened on the phone and I, I just knew that was it. That was my last resort. Mm. After that, I looked over the railing and saw the water and I saw there was nothing going to deter me. And for the first time in my life, I felt like this sort of peace over me because when I looked in that water, I knew that it was going to be over. I knew that I was never going to have to be a burden again. I was never going to have to wake up and feel the way I felt. I wasn't going to have to worry about failing at attempts anymore. I wasn't going to have to worry about living this lie anymore. Mm -hmm. I braced myself back for impact and I jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. If it wasn't for Sergeant Briggs distracting me from the place that I was in because I was in such a dark place. I think that the distraction got me out of enough of that place to where as I'm literally jumping over the bridge, I grab the railing and turn myself around on this and literally find my feet somehow hit this four inch cord on the inside mm. that's underneath. So I'm in awe myself some days as far as understanding how this occurred, understanding the cord that I was on, understanding the significance that it was nothing supporting my back. I mean, it's so many different facets of seeing something that could have went wrong. And somehow I ended up on this cord and we went on and ended up having the greatest conversation of my life. I mean, year to date. Hmm. Thank you for taking us through that. I want to hear about the conversation, but first I'd love for you, Kevin Briggs, to describe that day approaching the bridge and what you were seeing and feeling and thinking as you then eventually came upon Kevin Berthia? Certainly. For me, just another day out working the beat when I received a call of a man on the sidewalk talking on a cell phone saying that he's going to jump. Mm. So I happen to be on the north side of the bridge. So I stop around 50, 75 feet away from him and as I'm getting off of my motorcycle, what appears to me is he looks my direction and then he immediately takes some steps back and then jumps over this rail. And while he was doing this, I yelled something to him and I can't remember what it was, but he reached out, grabbed the rail, swung around, slammed into it and landed on this little bitty pipe. <gasps> I ran up there and then I could see his white t-shirt through the rails and then I just stepped back a bit and I had to get myself into my, okay, negotiator form now. What do I typically do and walk up on folks? And I have some different things that I do, but one that I generally use is I will raise my right hand, but I ask him, hi, I'm Kevin with the Highway Patrol. Is it okay if I come up and speak with you for a while? And I want to get their permission as I think they have been down so long it's very important to get their permission to allow me to walk up and speak with them. And he wanted nothing to do with me for a while, 10, 15 minutes or something. Uh, he just kept screaming at me. If you come one step closer, I'm jumping. And he was very serious. You could see the look in his eyes that he just wanted to be left alone to contemplate what he was going to do. You know, just leave this man alone. That's all he wanted. Nobody to be around him. But I kept on him and I'd give him a little bit of time to think. But I just said, hey, sir, I am not going to touch you. I'm not going to grab you. Nobody's going to sneak around on you. It's just me out here. And I just want the opportunity before you do anything to come up and speak with you for a bit. Now, mind you, this Golden Gate Bridge is a horrible place to do a negotiation. There's a lot of traffic going by, a lot of noise. There's pedestrians. We have to get other people out there to hold the pedestrians back. It's cold. It's windy. But this is what we have to work with. Kevin Berthia, what do you remember about that conversation? Up until that point, you have to realize something. I was 22 years old. I've never had a conversation about myself longer than five minutes in my life. Mm. So this was my very first conversation that was totally about me, that somebody was taking the time to really hear how I felt. And that's why the conversation was so powerful. And that's why a lot of things had to come out, because I finally was given the opportunity to speak. That's in some ways astounding to hear because if that is the case, how simple that is to give somebody space to actually check in with someone and hear how they're doing and let them speak about themselves. We tend to worry so much about how we treat other people that there's nothing that tells us how to love ourselves. Yeah. And because of that, we don't understand the value of who we are. Right. When you give the opportunity to listen to somebody, 
they are able to really hear their problems, which they can internally solve them. Briz couldn't solve my problems the day he met me, but he let me hear them. Mm. Once they got out, I was able to, you know, deal with them on a better level. Mm -hmm. Kevin Briggs, what do you remember about that conversation? And then where did it go? You know, I always want to make it about them. So first, I wanted to make sure that we could make a connection. I wanted to find out what has been going on and if there was something going on that day of why he's down at this bridge. So I wanted to give him time to vent. It allows him to get a lot of stuff out that maybe he hadn't been able to do or could do before. Sometimes it's easier speaking with a stranger, but it also gives me information that I could use at some point to try to talk to him to see, all right, let's look at things, maybe a little different point of view on this. Mm -hmm. I found out that he did want to speak. When we're allowed to vent without somebody interrupting us or trying to fix things, we feel a lot better afterwards. So that was my goal with this. What could I use? We call him a hook to try to get him to come back over that maybe he isn't seeing something quite as clearly as I can because he's in crisis. Mm -hmm. Kevin Bercia, when you came back up over the railing, tell me about how that impacted your life in the next days and, and even in the coming years. I've heard you speak a little bit about how it wasn't quite exactly this perfect, happy ending by any means. So I came back because he made me really, really realize if nothing else, I need to be for my daughter's birthday. I went to the bridge March 11th. And my daughter's birthday is April 6th, her first birthday. Mm. I wasn't excited about the fact that in my head, like, Kevin, you drove yourself to the Golden Gate Bridge and you literally almost jumped off. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to through my medical center for about 14 days and then I was in a hospital. And then when I got out the hospital, my mom showed me that my photo was front page of the San Francisco Chronicle. And that was the eye opener. I'm an athlete. Play, you know, four or five different sports growing up. So you want to be front page of the paper, but not like that. Mm -hmm. They didn't, couldn't see my face, and I think, you know, I'm grateful for that, for the other officer who was there to cover my face. But people that knew me from the back, they know me. My friends and family, they knew me. I knew my secret was out. I spent my whole life making people believe that I had it all together. I couldn't get over the fact that I drove myself to the bridge. I was so upset with myself. I shut down. I think I looked at the photo of the bridge probably twice in eight years, from March 11, 2005 until 2013, um, I didn't identify to myself as that was me in that photo. I didn't basically told myself it didn't happen. Um, I kind of ran away from family and friends and anybody that kind of knew me. I kind of got hidden in, in a relationship and I moved away and I just I never thought I had to deal with it. Mm. Did you still feel suicidal? Absolutely. By the time I got to 2013, I was up to 22 failed suicide attempts. I believe the bridge was number 11. And I had 10 more after the bridge. So by 2013, I was up to about, yeah, about 22. In that time frame, I never was seeking help. I never was on medication. I was a miracle because I don't even know how all that even happened, how I even got through those days, going through different things. My my grandfather passing away in 05, my other grandfather passed away in 07, custody battle in 08, 09, um, my own divorce in 2011. It was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and for me to get to a certain point, 2013, it took me a long time to really just accept that I had a mental health condition, that I identified with being an African-American man with the mental health condition. Mm -hmm. What happened in 2013 that was a turning point? 2013, I got the opportunity to be reunited with Sergeant Briggs. I knew nothing about Sergeant Briggs. I mean, I knew he was a cop, but I didn't know he was a cop that day. I was talking to him. Mm -hmm. My mom wrote him a letter back in 05 saying, thank you for being Kevin's guardian. Mm. My mom... I told her the day that she talked about that day and showed me that I was front page of the Chronicle, I never want to talk about this day. She respected that. And 2013, AFSP, America's Foundation for Suicide Prevention, was honoring Sergeant Briggs with a Lifesavers Award. And they reached out to my mom. And my mom <laughs> loved her to death, but she lied to me. And no. she <laughs> told me that I was going to New York. I don't know what she said, but she knows I don't ask questions. If something needs to be done, I'm just going to do it. She said she got some tickets to New York. I've never been to the Big Apple. So I'm thinking to myself, why, well, you know, I, oh, why not? Let's just go. Gosh. I didn't find out until I was in New York in the hotel room exactly why I was there. We met at the Columbus Circle, shake his hand. That moment changed my life. Between the bridge and then 
being in New York changed a lot of things for me, not only how I looked at myself, but how I looked at law enforcement. Kevin Briggs, what do you remember about that meeting? It was really something. The Lincoln Center in in New York City, overlooking Central Park. Yeah. We're sitting on the table at the ground level by the stage and all. And we're watching other people who had received some different awards. And all of a sudden it comes to my turn and they go up and introduce me. And it was interesting to watch Kev. And I learned this after the fact that he did not like that photograph of us. Because it shows a black man in a very weak point in their life. Totally understandable. I just didn't look at it like that. I looked at at a guy who was struggling. But when Kev came off of the stage, he got a standing ovation. And then as we talked about this, he figured, you know what? I can go out and I can turn this around and use this to help people. So that's kind of what he's done on his own and what we do when we get the opportunity to work together. So he's taking this what he thought was a a very terrible moment in his life and turned it around to where he has helped so many people. And it's really cool to see Mm -hmm. when we do uh, presentations together, the amount of people that fluctuate to him afterwards. I have a lot of questions, a lot of hugs going on. I'll get a couple (laughs) now and again, but they all flock to him. So it's it's fun to watch. (laughs) Wow. It's so interesting to think of the perspectives the ways in which looking at a photograph, people see it differently. And Briggs, you talked about this. Kevin Berthia, you mentioned how this photograph, you know, you didn't like it, you ignored it. And then eventually when you're seeing Kevin Briggs again, you said this changed a bit for you, even how you see law enforcement. I'd love for you to tell me more about that. Growing up in Oakland, it's a tough place. You don't understand how tough it is until you become an adult and understand how important law enforcement is. And growing up, I didn't really have great encounters with law enforcement. I didn't have uh, great conversations with law enforcement. I'm able to say law enforcement now, but back then it was just cops. Meeting Briggs and meeting his, his captain, Sean, at that, they didn't feel like cops. They didn't talk like co- It was just like, you guys are just regular people. Now I travel around, I, I've talked to a whole room full of law enforcement. I there, there are some that are like that are summer way, but there's more of them that really just do care and that they get into this line of work because they want to make a difference. And I advocate now for law enforcement to try to bridge that gap because we have to communicate with each other. We have to grow in this world together. And y'all probably one of the first African-American men from Oakland to ride in the front seat of, the, of the, in San Diego. I got a, a tour driving around. I went to got the opportunity to talk to San Diego Highway Patrol and I went down there. And I'm driving around in a highway patrol car in the front seat. Mm. And, you know, it's just the idea that I'm a, a black man from Oak, California, and that these things can happen. I use my story to build a bridge to make people understand that it's hope in this world. Yeah. I'm curious, Kevin Briggs, originally at the Golden Gate Bridge, you didn't have training. Where do you see an opportunity for growth? And where do you see hope in ways in which we can train law enforcement And how are you participating in that? I'm doing a number of things. One, there's crisis text line. I'm on their board for law enforcement. And Kev, we work together as much as we can. There's things that their crisis intervention team training, CIT. So I think law enforcement has come a long way in 20 years. I think it has a ways to go, but they're even looking at, and a lot of departments are having mental health professionals ride with the officers, which is wonderful. I didn't like the idea when it first came out, but now that I've seen it in action with a number of departments and being able to speak both with the officers and the mental health professional, I think it's a great thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's tough in law enforcement because what happens, unfortunately, is if you are not law enforcement, then you have to build the clout to come in and speak with them. It's like, you haven't walked in my shoes, so how dare you come in and try to preach to me? It it doesn't go over well. But if you come in without an ego and we talk to folks and we share experiences, fantastic. And that's what this is about. But look at what we're dealing with. More mental illness calls every single year. And a lot of those have escalated based on many parts to an individual being hurt or, you know, being killed 
on both sides, actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They start with people being in pain, and then they escalate to that person being hurt by another. And then the cycle of pain in the courtrooms and all the and blame and all the things. Oh, you're exactly right. And that goes on both sides. But I think we have an obligation to folks to try to understand what's going through and not be rushed through this looking like this as a business. Okay, get this done. Get this individual. Take them into custody. Let's go. We got more calls on the way. What is the range of people that you're serving with this work? Jewish community centers, been to a number of those. Mm -hmm. Military, construction workers, which I'm doing more and more work with construction workers. They have a huge rate of suicide. Mm. I've I've done two attorneys events. Attorneys. Yeah. Like Look at the stress. Mm -hmm. Mm. Jails. Yeah. I've had the opportunity over the last five, six years to pretty much speak to almost every walk of life. I've done an elderly home. I've got an opportunity to speak at a preschool because everybody's affected because we're all human. Right. We don't know how to process them because we haven't been properly trained. And that's all it is. I did want to add on this. Yes. Kevin and I have talked about this quite a bit. It is our therapies and what we do. So we both take medication. And I tell folks, if you need it, it's worth a try. And don't stop it. This is a big one. Do not stop medication without letting your doctor know. Mm-hmm. But part of our therapy is after we speak, talking to folks. That is a really huge asset, telling us what they thought of the presentation, telling us their story. Mm-hmm. It sounds stingy on our part, but it's actually therapy for a us. Of, it is. Mm-hmm. A lot of times they haven't even told anybody this, and they'll be comfortable enough to tell you. So just to be able to create that platform for people, is just, it, it, I'm without words sometimes. Do you feel like you have to struggle with your depression on a daily basis or with anxiety or anything as you're carrying this work? I'm curious if there are days where it's difficult for you to to do it. Absolutely. (laughs) Many days. Absolutely. I I had one yesterday. I went downstairs. I told my girlfriend, oh, my God, September's coming up. September's Suicide Awareness Month. And I was just, I was just overwhelmed. And I was like, oh my God. And she would take it easy, one step at a time. It's like you're dealing with life and death every day and you're opening yourself up to that. So, I mean, Kevin Berthia, how many times are you contacted? Since probably June of 2013, I haven't had a day go by where somebody doesn't inbox me. Wow. You reached out to a perfect stranger. Like that takes a lot of courage. So I always try to tell people that, but it is a lot. I can't explain how much it is, but I was given this life because I can live it. Something about who I am can handle all this because I really genuinely want people not to feel alone. Once you've lived in that dark place that I've lived in for so many years, you don't want nobody to experience it for a moment. Days that it takes so much out of me, I know that somebody's alive because of that. Mm -hmm. It took a lot to get up this morning. Mm -hmm. And that's just what the reality is. But I don't have to be sad all day. I got here. Look what came out of this. I got these great interview. I got to see Briggs. It's a beautiful day. If I was mad this morning, I'm not going to be mad all day, Kevin. Just be mad in that moment. Let it pass. So I'm just doing a better job of just dealing with emotions and when they happen. Yeah. And it is true. It's so moment to moment. How do you encourage family members or caregivers or people who are close to people who are struggling? Patience. I've been to funerals. And I've watched the impact of families who don't have that patience or who don't want to reach out. And I don't want that for any family. So I always try to make people understand that patience is the greatest thing that you can give anybody in a dark place. Yeah. Like, because they don't want to be in that dark place. Mm -hmm. And patience and really listening to somebody are critical tools when somebody's really overwhelmed and dealing with it really in their head. Yeah. What do you say to people who can't be there all the time? Like for the people who missed it. You're, you're not going to always be able to see it. I was the greatest at making people think that everything was fine. We don't want people to really see how we really are because we want them to look at us for face value. Because we're afraid of if they see us how we see ourselves, they won't love us the way we want us to love us. Yeah. We're all afraid to really be who we are because we don't want the world to see who we really are. Not knowing that everybody in the world is doing the same thing. The more time that we be real about how we really feel, the better we can deal with emotions. Yeah. Kevin Briggs, anything to say to that? Yes. Um, 
I did lose my grandfather to suicide. This occurred before I was born, so I've never had the opportunity to meet him. And I have a son who is suicidal, who's going through therapies right as we speak. And it is absolutely brutal to live with this. My ex-wife says every day she's afraid to go home because she doesn't know what she's going to find. And it just breaks my heart. As much as I don't want it, it is their choice. We can do what we can. We can watch the medications, make sure they're taking them. If they are prescribed any that day, we can get rid of the guns in the house. We can do a lot of different things, setting it up, and we can try to get them therapies and be there for them and really sit down and take the time and say, you know what? I'm here for you. You call me anytime you want. You know, there's the 988 suicide prevention line that's out there for folks now. Yeah. Um, There's the crisis text line that's available for folks. There's a lot of things out there, but they also have to want to live. And that's easy for me to say, but I'm telling you, coming from a guy who's lost someone to suicide, who lost people on the Golden Gate Bridge, whose son is suicidal. There's nothing easy about this. And also, um, I don't even think Kev knows this, but my sister lost her son July 1st from alcohol. And you know, it looks like it could have been a, a suicidal act also. He was just 31 years old. And she called me when the coroner was at her house and it was just to hear the screaming in her voice. And then for me to have to notify the rest of the family that this 31 year old, my nephew is gone. There's a lot of pain. Folks have to want to get better. Now, part of the grieving process, there's a lot that goes into it, of course, but I would look at it. How would those people who were lost want you to live? Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't make it a whole lot easier, but at least there's a little bit of light in there. And I actually have talked to people. Uh, I lost a guy on July 22nd, 2013, before I retired. He told me specifically, you know, right straight out, I don't want anybody to suffer. Right. He goes, I just can't take this anymore. And, you know, nothing that I can say that we can say really is going to make anything easier. My sister is going through hell right now every single day because of the loss of her kid. Mm-hmm. All we can do is be there for them. Yeah. You know, and be there for one another. Well, I ask from a really personal place, but you know, it it struck me when you were telling the story, Kevin Berthia, you were talking about the day that you walked to the bridge and you were like saying how you asked for directions and you kind of were hoping maybe she would ask you. You know, it's like these moments, moments, moments of decision that can go one way or another. And in many ways in life, that's how it is. That's all we have. We all, all we have everyone. is a yeah. window of opportunity. Right. We don't realize how important that connection is with people in those critical moments. When that window is open and that expectation is there. Because a lot of people in society don't have an expectation of a people because they've been hurt so bad. But there is that moment that they open that window and and we don't we don't flood it with positivity like we should. Right. We just got to get better as humans. Yeah. But I think it is really powerful as well to recognize that there is a choice. Everybody has agency and unfortunately sometimes we don't have all of the resources that we ought to when we are making decisions like that. So I think there's a lot of awareness and a lot of hope in the work that you're doing because I think that things are shifting and the more that we are aware of all of these different possibilities, you know, the more that we can be there for each other. And so I want to know from both of you, where do you find the hope in the work that you're doing? I'm going to go out on on this one and say we find hope in the people that we speak with. That's it. And each other. Mm Mm-hmm. We have down times, but we we bring each other up. We can text each other or call each other anytime. But to have someone after a talk and to meet people afterwards, to say, you know what? Thank you. I've been in such a dark place. Your guys talk helped me so much. I'm going to go and seek some professional help. Or now I have a path and it's clear, you know, because we also provide tools for folks of um, handling things themselves a bit, their own self-care. And we talk about a crisis safety plan and a number of things. And I think that's what it's about is making a difference. That's it. hundred percent. When somebody inboxes you and say, I'm alive because of you, 
you can't do nothing but keep going. I can't put every broken person in the, in the world in one room and tell them how important they are. So I, I have to be contingent on the one that I move every day. So I look forward to that every day. Yeah. <laughs> Christina's texting me to ask me why I got all personal. To be honest, and I don't think this will go on the podcast, but my mom died in a car accident that was ruled a suicide. And it was ruled a suicide by the state highway patrol, obviously the coroner and all that. But I'm just looking for answers, you know? And so yeah. it's hard because I've grown up with mental illness all around. And and it's like so hard sometimes to to hold your ground and to be there. And I think that we all need to listen to each other and to hear each other. And it's so, so encouraging the work that you're doing. Because it's like, this means that people like my mom might, you know, they might have a different outcome. And it, it's just, it's really powerful. And I still, t- it's been six years and I still to this day ask myself the questions that I was asking you, you know, like, mm-hmm. We, we carry around a lot of guilt and a lot of, I don't know, grappling with, is this something that was even intentional and how much thought went into it and how, so I think it's really um, powerful to be able to hear from both of you, you know, so that people who are experiencing that, it's just so much more um, power that we can, we can go into a situation with and, and so much more love. So thank you. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, that's exactly what so many people are dealing with after something like that, whether that's a suicide or not, is there's unanswered questions, there's blame, there's guilt. Yeah. But when it really comes down to it in the middle of the night, how would your mom want you to live your life? Yeah. Mm -hmm. She'd want you to be happy and doing what you're doing right now, which is making a difference. Yep. Well, thank you. <laughs> I did not expect yeah. to have this part of the conversation with you. And I feel like I just got to go to one of your events and we are talking after stage and I'm like giving you so many hugs. <laughs> now you see how it goes. <laughs> you didn't get the bill yet, did you? <laughs> you guys got me. You got me. Oh my gosh. All right, you two. Thank you so much for sharing from your experience. It has really meant the world to me. And I know that so many others are going to benefit from this. So thank you. And, and we'll see you soon. I hope. I am so grateful to both Kevin Berthia and Kevin Briggs for their courage and vulnerability in sharing their story. It gives me so much hope. We'll include links in the show notes, but I want to share with you how you can connect with them and support their work. Kevin Berthia is at kevinberthiafoundation.org. And Kevin Briggs is at pivotal-points.com. That's pivotal points with the hyphen between the two words. Hope is My Middle Name is hosted by me, Kate Tucker. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter at Kate Tucker Music. This episode was produced by Christine Fennessy, executive produced by Rachel Swaby, with editing from Audrey Noh. Our sound designer and engineer is Mark Bush. Music by the fantastic artists at Epidemic Sound and me. Big thanks to Connor Gaughan, our publisher and fearless leader at Consensus Digital Media. Hope is My Middle Name can be found on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It would mean so much to us if you would follow, rate, and leave us a review. Hope is My Middle Name is a podcast by Consensus Digital Media, produced in association with Reasonable Volume. See you next time.